Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I jump in in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. to the spark file where we believe that everyone is creative but no one creates alone i'm laura camion and i'm susan blackwell if you're an og listener welcome back sparkler if you're joining us for the first time know that all are welcome here whether your creativity has been on pause during this time or if you've clung to it like a lifeline welcome (laughs) welcome (laughs) but you may be asking yourself what exactly is a spark file where do i get a spark file what do i file in a spark file these are such good questions and we actually do have answers Mm -hmm. a spark file is a place where you consistently collect all your inspirations and fascinations here's the deal we are makers who make all kinds of things if you're anything like us and you're making stuff all the time or want to be making stuff all the time you know the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry especially now but do not despair we are on the lookout for fresh ideas images and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast or a new holiday display for your front yard I'm here for it. Or a commitment to strengthening our ability to bounce back. Mm, Every episode, we're going to reach into the spark file and exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us too. And if you're not careful, you might just breathe some new life into yourself. So without further ado, let's open up the The spark spark file. file. Guess what time Black it is, Cams? Well, it's time. Spark File time. It's Spark File time. It's season two time. It's we're not, season two time. We're not messing around this time, though. This isn't a teaser. This isn't a catch up. This is us. Seuss. We're back in the saddle, Cams. We're like, like legit for real back in the saddle. Um, the saddle is so like ill-fitting at the moment that I even messed up that little <laughs> bit in the intro. I'm like, oh, this saddle, I totally forgot. Did you mess up? Our, I, didn't, I, did. I didn't notice anything. In, but. Well, we usually lightly refer, like we sort of tease. I don't know if you haven't figured out that, listeners. We sort of tease what's coming up. And I did my holiday display. And then after that, I was like, oh, yeah, we tease things here. This is a spot where we tease things. <laughs> it's been a little while, and I'm just removing the cobwebs, removing the cobwebs right now. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like we just live in the realness. We just live where we, we are. Do. And this is where we are. So much has happened since so the much last has time. Happened. I forgot the format. Um, you forgot the format. You remembered the format. <laughs> we have elected a new president oh, and a new yes. vice president. That's big. It's big. I feel more hopeful, more optimistic. Yes. And 
And yes. that makes me feel more energetic and creative. 100%. I think we needed to feel and see like a light at the end of the tunnel, that there was some something that was going to affect some change because yeah. we can't go on as we were. Like it was just one of this year <sighs> for one has been so full of so many hardships. Like there had yeah. to be a indication that we were going to get on a track to heal and improve our situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. This is our moment. We're we're recording this. I would say about 24 hours after the election results came out. So we're still basking in the glory of that, but there is so much there's so much that has to be done and so many things mm-hmm. that have to be addressed. Um, and that work is, that is coming. But um, right now we're just still, just still just floating a on a cloud. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but there's a lot of work to be done and that's why it's so good to be creative because we need to be creative <sighs> about how we're going to address some of this stuff. It's so true. Some creative problem solving is going to come in handy. Yeah. I also mm-hmm. think, I think we're in it for, for the coming I don't know how forever how for how long, but I feel like the current president is I keep thinking of him like an animal, like a wild animal that has been wounded but but is still like ranging and roaming and i'm I'm nervous that he's going to be even more sort of unpredictable and dangerous and um yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I was reading a thing that's that said he's going to be lashing out against the people who did this to him, namely us, the American people. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see how that manifests. But I'm I don't want to um, I don't want to give over to that yeah, fear. We don't have to. We don't have to energize that. I'm not going to energize that. Much. I'm going to energize yeah. my optimism and possibility. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That there, that there is, there are people willing to do the work that you mentioned, you know, all of us included, like we, I think everyone's got eyes wide open, there's work to do. Um, and I'm very thankful that speaking, we're in it with people who are willing to do the work. Yes. And speaking of work to do, I just want to shout out all of our friends, like friends of the podcast, friends who have like really used their creativity and put oh some God. muscle behind Erica Henningsen. Yes. Erica Henningsen, getting, getting out, out first time boat. voters. Yes. Um, I just think of so many people, Celia, Keenan Bulger, people who were like yes. out there making it happen, phone banking, just yeah. really throwing their. Karen Olivo. Yes. Oh so my gosh. Many. So it's many. so, it was, it was just an absolute thing of beauty to see. I'm, so many friends like doing the text campaigns, the letter yeah. postcard campaigns, every bit of it. You know, we've talked before about there's so many ways to um, to contribute, whether it's like giving five bucks whenever those texts come through, or it's being on the other end of like sending the texts and the letters or being out holding up signs outside, but whatever your level of comfort you know, your, your, um, engagement level, you're making a difference. Everyone contributed to an overall change. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of people that, it's so funny, I have a few stories to tell you. Um, first of all, a friend of ours who is, uh, I'm going to say like a world famous celebrity, uh, Mm, who I won't name because I don't have their permission to tell the story, but this, this person was doing a lot of campaign work via text Mm -hmm. and they would just sign their first name. So, you know, if you've received those texts that are like, Hey, this is blank. Uh, I'm (laughs) fighting for Joe Biden. And I'm wondering if we can count on you for blank. (laughs) They were doing that and they were using their real first name, but I thought how funny and how thrilling would it be for people if they knew that like Who that movie was. starts yes people are people who Amazing. are doing that work yeah Amazing. because a lot of those people aren't necessarily like working right now and so they wanted to use this time and throw it behind this very very vital work which i loved and yes 
people who made it happen, people who use their creativity, people who took disappointment and turned it into, took their Helen back and made it their gift. I want to talk about Stacey Abrams. I was I, just going to say the word Stacey yes. Abrams. How about Stacey Abrams? I'd like to Amazing. see Stacey Abrams in the White House. Yes, indeed. I Somehow feel I like, feel like that's in her future. I oh feel like man. that's going to happen. I really what do. What Stacey Abrams accomplished is extraordinary. And of course, and she didn't talk, do it alone. She didn't do it alone, but we often talk because we're fascinated with this topic of failure or perceived failure. That's right. And this is a woman who did not win her race, came very, very close, and now just turned around, took took all that energy and helped Biden Harris win the White House. And what you know, like it's really all about what you do with the experience of Uh, you know, do you shrink away and say, oh, I guess I, you know, I guess I failed at this or, you know, do what you did and turn it completely or do what she did and turn it on its side and say, oh, okay, I've got a, I've got a lot of power here. My voice is, is being heard and I'm going to utilize it to make change. It is an amazing example of let me try that again. Let me extend the story and rewrite the ending. Um, but I don't think it's an ending for Stacey Abrams. I think I don't know. I just think when there are people, I don't know, that capable, that uh, smart, that are fighting so hard for the powers of good, it's, it. oh my God. It's just, inspiring. It is inspiring. inspiring. It's so sparkish. It is so good. Um, (laughs) What else do I want to tell you? You know, one of my greatest challenges in life is how to get back to shit that I'm trying to find later, which is why it's good to have a spark file. Mm -hmm. But just now I was like, um, where did I put that? And it was, I put it at the top of my spark file so I'd find it. (laughs) No. And then you couldn't find it. That's, no, that's right. That's right. Classic. Okay. 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 So I would, this is on a completely different topic. Okay. So, um, Sometimes if you if you're listening for the first time, welcome. This is not a political podcast. This is actually a creativity podcast. But um we like to when we see uh, a spark that we've covered before, when we see a little update, we like to share it. And I saw this I saw this tweet over the summer when we were on our little breaky poo and I've been holding on to it because I wanted to share it with you. This is an update to it's not an update. It's more like a just like a fun side spark to our episode that we did. I did a, a Halloween episode last year about Mercedes McCambridge and how she oh. provided the voice of the devil in the movie, The Exorcist. So we were talking, we talked a lot about um, William Peter Blatty who wrote the book, The Exorcist. And I saw this tweet and I was like, I've got to share that this with Camion. So this was tweeted by someone named Nelson Nomicon is their Twitter handle at okay. Nelson Nomicon. And the tweet said, since the exorcist is trending, I think it's a good time to repost this wonderful anecdote from William Peter Blatty. And here's the anecdote. It's very brief. When I worked at BMP, the head of television commuted in from Brighton every day. He started reading The Exorcist on the train. He said he thought it was the most evil book he'd ever read. In fact, he said it was so evil he couldn't finish it. So at the weekend, he went to the end of Brighton Pier and threw it as far as he could. So I went to the bookshop. I bought another (laughs) copy. I ran it under the tap and I left it in his desk drawer for him to find. That is awesome. That that's amazing. Made me laugh so hard. I don't know if it's true, but I thought it was really, really, really fucking funny. Oh, that's good. Come that's on, good. that's creative right there. That is that's a creative prank. Creativity at work. I enjoyed that very much. But anyway, is there anything else, Cams, before we dig into our spots? Um. I think we've covered it. I think we're up to date. This is 
you know, up to the moment reporting oh, here. Oh, no, no. Why? We haven't Why? even, oh my gosh, the, 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 the workshop. We haven't even talked about the workshop. So on January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, we are going to be hosting the Spark File 2021 Creativity Kickoff. Mm -hmm. Cam's, how would you describe it? First of all, it's going to like jumpstart your creativity into the next year. It's going to solidify and determine like your creative path for the year. It's going to Absolutely. make sure that you prioritize first thing, January 1st, this will be a year of creativity for you. And the cool thing is, because of the pandemic, it is going to be virtual. So you yes. can you can join us from anywhere in the world. As long as you can Zoom yourself in, you can join us. And it's going to be, I know sometimes we can all get like Zoom fatigue and Zoom numbed out. But this is going to be more like a active virtual retreat. I, mm. I think it's going to be so yummy and so delicious. And we have been leading these virtual workshops with people and they are, they don't leave like, uh, my eyes are crossed. They leave so excited and so ready to continue rocking. So that's coming up and there'll be more information about that at the sparkfile.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What did you say? What was the verb you just used? You, you can what around? Goof around. Goof around. I talked over it for a second. I thought you said oh. dick around. And I was like, that doesn't <laughs> sound like something Camion would say. Not usually, but Not. I suppose it's possible. <laughs> you, this is this is the new fresh attitude you're bringing to season two. <laughs> Fuck around and find out. Yeah. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. That's whoa, whoa. like that's a new phrase that I just learned. There were like some signs <laughs> in regard to like Philadelphia, not to bring it back to politics, but there were some signs that West was showing West was showing me. There were some really funny things and. And I don't know where this phrase came from, but someone had the sign that said, fuck around and find out. And <laughs> what I was does like, that mean? I think it means try me. You think I won't oh, do that? Fuck me. around and find out. I think that's what it means. Oh, that's I what I've adapted it. it. <laughs> no, I was like, Wes, fuck I'm going to keep and that. Find out. I want a yeah. t shirt that says that, except fuck I'd be, I, 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 like, a part of me wants, I want to be the person that would wear that t shirt, but I actually probably I wouldn't. wouldn't be the I person totally that wouldn't. Wear Just like I wouldn't say dick around. But I right now, I can laugh about saying it. I swear to God, it, that's what I you totally just said. Wouldn't. Roll the clip, roll the tape. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna goof around. when I edit this episode, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna like I'm gonna ADR that on you so that you actually do something. <laughs> and then here I am claiming, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I it's swear. because you're a liar. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, wait, okay. I feel a little giddy to be honest. I feel a little drunk with excitement to power get back to and, and power. To get back. I mean, always. I'm always drunk with power. Oh my god. Um, but fuck so around yeah. and find out is my new favorite. Fuck around and find out. <laughs> I really loved it. I laughed so hard. I don't, I don't know why. And I was like, what does this have to do with Philadelphia? Like, I was like, is that a thing? Is that a phrase? And Wes was like, I don't know, but we were too busy laughing. So God, that's funny. That's really, yeah. really funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> last thing I said before the fight broke out. I love that. Um, <laughs> all right, should we should we dig in? Yeah. Do you want you want to spark it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go first. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited right now, um, but I'm I'm getting myself back into the mindset of when I wrote this spark, and the truth is like, oh, Suze, I struggled a lot during this time of. Um, the break that we took. And I'm really, really glad we took a break. For those of you who know us, you know, like we didn't really break. We've been working on um, a lot of workshops and a lot of um, behind the scenes work, if you will. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. We just took a break from the podcast, but, but we needed essentially to, you know, prioritize resting and restoring and replenishing yeah. all yeah. the things that we talk about, like refilling the fish pond. Um, and I'm glad we did that. But as we approached the launch of season two, I, you know, I can't lie, actually. I'm not a liar. 
There <laughs> were. Look around to find out. I always think about you when people, sometimes on a, I'm on Zoom, people will be like, Laura, your face. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I was thinking something. And I think about you because you're like, you don't have a poker face. If, if I'm no. thinking it, it's on you, my face. It, you, it, it, it's, a, it's like, it's a gift for us. It's a gift for, <laughs> as an actor. Like it's great. But, but you, in real life, you, you Laura Camion have to know that you, you kind of wear it on your sleeve. Yeah. I reveal yeah. it all. Yeah. 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 So since you can't see my face right now, I will reveal to you that as we approach season two, there were moments that I was really wondering about our mission and we've always been clear about it. And I am I love it. It's to help ourselves and help others fear less and create more. Yeah. And we genuinely believe in the power of creativity. But in my darkest moments, this pandemic kind of had me wondering about how relevant creativity is, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I felt like yeah. the world had changed since, since we launched. And there were moments when I really doubted whether or not creativity was the answer. There were so many pressing issues like social injustice and climate change yeah. and the divisiveness yeah. of our country. I just was like, uh, is encouraging creativity helpful? You know, and I didn't Can think I, this all the time, but it's just enough that I yeah. noticed it, you know, yeah. had crept in there. Sorry, you, you go ahead. You were going to say something. I was just going to say that I, I, I hear you, I feel you, and I, also, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, how how are any of these things going to be addressed and solved? Mm-hmm. It's going to have to be through some form of applied imagination, aka creativity. Hundred percent. So 100%. creativity doesn't always mean like. And then I made, uh, I took this paper and I made a bouquet of flowers out of it, or I painted this picture. Creativity is also pr- like things like problem solving. I know, I know, yeah. all of that. Like I'm one hundred percent. I'm so with you, and I didn't think this all the time, but I, as we approach this episode, I was just like, I'm just seeing this little stream of doubt. I'm seeing that it had crept in and I need to explore this so I can put this away. You know what Mm. I, so I can just put it to rest. Like Mm. what, what is this exploration? So, yes, you know, we've talked many times about how creatives were using their talents and their creativity to fight injustices. We even talked to Bonnie Siegel about her book, Signs of Resistance, where she literally chronicles how artists and graphic designers have have either unified or captured an entire mm-hmm. movement, even contributed to its impact through the design mm-hmm. of an image or a work of art. So obviously I know the the power is there, but I also felt this need to go deeper and explore it a little bit further. I felt sparked to find out more ways that creativity was used for the power of good. Mm-hmm. And in this case, you know, you know, when you're harvesting sparks, like sometimes a spark finds you, but sometimes you really need a spark and you go searching for it yeah. specifically. And yeah. so this spark is, This is just a few of the things I found when I went in search of the value of creativity. Oh my God, I love this. Um, I believe in creativity in so many of its forms, but sometimes when life is really challenging, it can feel like a luxury or an indulgence. Yeah, and I love that you're cracking this open. Well, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to share with you some things I found in search of. Awesome. In search of. Also, I wanted to use the phrase in search of. Do you remember those TV shows? I think Um, that's a show you really loved. I loved it in uh, in school. They used to, you know, put those on. It would be like in search of (laughs) Roanoke (laughs) Island or something. Oh, my God. That sounds like a day when the teacher was hungover and was just like, today we're going to have video day. That is correct. And I loved it. I <laughs> absorbed every bit of it. Still fascinated by Roanoke Island. I need to do a spark about that, by the way. Oh, that is um, a good, that's a good spark. Yeah, I think they just discovered a settlement <gasps> near there that might explain what happened to it. So I, I'll dig into that. What? That'll be for, mm-hmm, You're mm-hmm. kidding. Yeah, I've heard nothing of this, but we've been be a little continued. busy. And the news cycle has been captured by other stories. That's right. Um, I that's amazing. That I would love to hear that. 
Yeah, I put it in my smart file. So we'll circle back on that one. But awesome. here we are today, right today, now, and the right value now. of creativity. Creativity. Yes. So I came across an article in Forbes written by Amanda Porsche, and Amanda describes herself as a highly sensitive autistic female. As an autistic person, she said, she thrives on routine and sudden change can be literally catastrophic. Wow. So, of course, we all know our world turned on a dime in March 2020. And for Amanda, who lived in New York, she lost the routines that served her um, and they served as her coping mechanism. She lost her job, her ability to see friends, family, attend her support groups, and it became very bleak very fast for her. That would be it, hard for anybody, but it would be especially uh-huh. hard if you're, if it's really that sort of, um, abrupt change is, in, is even tougher on you. That's right. That's right. amazing. Yeah. And in this article, she describes hearing the, what she called the death sirens of the ambulances, sometimes up to 200 sirens a day. Ugh. She describes seeing bodies, in body bags, being put into U-Haul trucks, and things oh. got especially bad when she saw her neighbor being put into an ambulance. Oh, my gosh. It was just a very, very scary and isolating time. And during that time, she felt, <clears throat> you know, she felt despondent at first, but then began drawing and painting. And according to Forbes, Amanda described feelings of rage, uncertainty, anxiety, um, fear about her own mortality, and found that starting an unplanned art project was the only thing that brought her any relief. She said, I would often start painting or drawing with no outlines, plans, or expectations. It was as if I let my feelings take the lead. If I messed up, I would just continue and turn my work into something entirely different. She got to the point where she was creating one work of art each day. She began posting the work online. She had offers to purchase her work, but more importantly, she found that it resonated with others. She often painted her feelings about being isolated from other people and then to find that so many other people felt the same way. I found that so interesting because it really was the gift that keeps on giving because just the sheer creation of the work was therapeutic for her. But then finding out that she was not alone in her loneliness was an added bonus, you know, an unexpected bonus. Yeah. In fact, Amanda wasn't doing any of this for anyone else. It was sheer survival for her. She said, I don't care how my work looks or who likes it. I do it for myself. I do it for my own sanity and survival. With COVID-19, we've learned that humans have very little control. Nature will do as it pleases. Art allows me to have some control back in my life. Mm. Amanda's now looking to going into school, going back to school and learning more about careers in the arts. She said, I would even go so far as to say, art saved my life. Now art is my life. I was really inspired by her story because... yeah. It's a simple, like, you know, as individuals, I think we often, you know, we just, when someone makes like some huge thing that captures the entire world's um, imagination, we're like, oh, okay, all the praise gets heaped on that one person. But every single day, there are people who are literally surviving on creating art and being creative. And it's not Mm -hmm. for anyone else. It's for Mm -hmm. themselves. And I just thought she was one of those, just, just a piece of evidence um, about how, you know, a simple practice like that could help you keep it together during, you know, a time that could have been catastrophic for her. Yeah. I love that. So I'd love to see her art too. I'm so curious about what it looks like. You totally can. Um, I will post her Instagram page when we, when we post this episode, I'll share her Instagram page as well. Yeah. Awesome. Is it Um, like abstract? Is it like, as you were talking, I was like, I wonder if it looks like Hilma off Clint. I wonder if it looks like, like things are just moving through her and she's just like, it's a little more like, um, who was it that did the scream one? The, um, 
Oh, Munch, Edvard Munch. Yeah, like um, she has some where uh, that's what it, sp- it spoke to me in that realm of sort of silent scream. She had one called the Pandemic Scream. Um, wow. Yeah, that it's, rage. it's yeah. powerful. That's amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yay. Um, so I was inspired by Amanda's story, but nonetheless, I continue to gather evidence in favor of our beloved creativity. (laughs) Next, I read about group programs that use art and creativity to help various populations of people. In California, four prisons participated in arts programs for their prisoners. And I know they're not alone in this. I know they happen everywhere, but now I'm like passionate about supporting them. Oh my God, yes. Um, These These four prisons studied the results of of, um, these classes and then published what they learned in the Justice Policy Journal. And the Mm. following programs were created, and um, they include, one, the Actors Gang Prison Project at the California Rehabilitation Center. That was led by Tim Robbins' Actors Gang. Yeah. recall, he starred in Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. The Marion Shakespeare Theater Program, as well as a poetry class at San Quentin State Prison, a visual arts class at the Correctional Training Facility, and a writing course at New Folsom State Prison. So what they were hoping to do was quantify whether or not participation in fine arts activities could be transformative. And here's what they found. Regardless of years in the program, nearly everyone said that art helps them express themselves, relieve stress, feel happier, be creative, and make better choices. Most also reported that art helps them to better understand themselves and to work with others. And a majority of participants reported they got along better with other inmates while pursuing their art and They liked themselves better the longer Uh, they were in the program. Never underestimate the power of liking yourself. Oh my God, my my head is sparking (laughs) sparks. There are cartoon sparks sparking out of my ears. Sparking out of your head. I just, I mean, that makes me so happy. And I read a little further. Interestingly, Tim Robbins, who, as I mentioned, played a prison inmate in the 1994 film, The Shawshank Redemption. Yes. He says he may actually get more out of the actor's gang prison project than the inmates do. He's very actively involved in the project. And in an article for BBC News, he said, this is so much more fulfilling to be in this struggle and this exploration than in any other like thousand dollar plate dinner fundraiser I'd been to. It oh, puts, yes. Uh, right? This is so interesting. Yes, he said, yes. it puts that other crap that people in this industry deal with into perspective. Where am I? Who am I? What's my last movie? How successful am I? What's my current rating? It's a nightmare, really. A self-obsessed nightmare of survival in, in Hollywood. And here was an opportunity to throw all that away and figure out how to help this dude. And if you can get through to this guy. Like what an amazing feeling to be able to see someone change from a darkened, negative, shut off person into a sentient human being and potential leader of men. And I thought it was so, so interesting because it's a little bit of what he's kind of talking a little bit about what you said, like there is the there's the luxury and perhaps overindulgence of mm. inner exploration. And yeah, then there's yeah. the use of art to help others, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Like sometimes art can be healing, I think, because we go inward and explore our own feelings. And sometimes we can use art as a way to get out of self-obsessed thoughts and put the focus on other people. That is so great. So again, there's like benefits from like multiple angles. Can I add some sparks to those sparks? Yes, yes, add some sparks. So um, a few things. I... One of my, this is a spark I've had in my file for a while and I should uh, like trot it out. I just want to figure out the best way to, to bring it, bring it to y'all listeners. But Ear Hustle is really one of my, I'm going to say top two favorite podcasts. Mm -hmm. It is made in the media lab at San Quentin and it is so, I hope I'm not jumping your spark, but it is so good. It is so freaking good. And 
I love it so much. I learned so much from it about so many different things. So I'd love to uh, just, here's a spark spoiler, like share that with people. If, you, if you're mm-hmm. not already tuned into Ear Hustle, it's so good. But also um, on, the, on our little breaky poo, I had the um, opportunity to interview a really interesting human being named Kenyatta Hughes, who was incarcerated for decades. And he was in Sing Sing, and he was part of a program that was sponsored by Carnegie Hall. Mm. And they brought a very, um, she's, you know, a very famous, very significant opera diva named Joyce DiDonato to work with the incarcerated men at Sing Sing. And they, she worked with them on musical composition and Joyce and Kenyatta met and began collaborating while he was incarcerated. And he, the day, de- oh my God, he is such a spark. Maybe I should mm-hmm. just save this and we should just have him as a guest. Well, because- yeah. Yeah, he's he's just uh, I just see the way that creativity can really do all the things that you just described to help yeah. people understand their lives, to help people um understand like themselves, themselves. Yes. like themselves and have something really purposeful to do with yeah. with their lives. When we talk about transformation, I mean, is there like any more perfect example than, than these programs? Like you're literally trying to help someone transform their life and what's possible for them once they, once they leave prison for them to change their vision for their life and what, and what they're capable of. I mean, it's, I, I, it's really powerful. It's really powerful. Yeah. Oh my God. I, this spark is giving Yay. me life. I'm so excited and I'm excited so um, for, uh, you know, to, to explore that spark even further and hopefully. Yeah. Have yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So another program that caught my attention is a joint effort between Northwestern university and the looking glass theater company that seeks to increase the quality of life for patients living with Alzheimer's dementia and other memory no affected disorders. Way. Yes. It's called the Memory Ensemble, and they use improv techniques and activities to draw upon memories that are still accessible. And if they're not accessible, they utilize the opportunity to create a new memory on the spot, which I just think is amazing. The motto of this class, the motto of this class is, I am a creative person. When I feel anxious or uncertain, I can stop, breathe, observe and use my imagination. Oh. I mean, if that's not like a pl- like applying your imagination, like, like in any moment, in any circumstance, I just, I loved this motto for the class, but I will think Will you it's, say it again? Yes, will I will. Will you say it over time? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I, cause I think it's a fantastic motto for anyone, anytime. I feel like this is, this, this kind of speaks to something in my spark and I want it printed on the inside of my eyelids. So go ahead and say it again. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. I'm a creative person. When I'm I feel, a creative person. Mm-hmm. When I feel anxious or uncertain. When I feel anxious or uncertain. I can stop, breathe, observe, and use my imagination. I can stop, breathe, observe, and use my imagination. And is that to say, Camion, that I can imagine and create sort of like, I can disrupt that and create what I want the next moment to be? I think it can mean that. For me, it really sparks me because I think of like everyday moments when we may not be conscious of using our creativity, but it is there Mm. to be had. Mm. Like if we trust, to me, it's like if we trusted our brains, like if you're let's say you're afraid you might get called on in class or you might get called on in a meeting to provide an answer that you're unsure about. You can stop, breathe, observe, and use your imagination. Hmm. And just know that your brain is going to be there for you. I think it really builds that trust in yourself and your own abilities. Because I, I imagine like if you have dementia, um, even if you're in a moment 
where you feel present, the fear that it might get whisked away, you know, that you can't trust your brain, basically, that, you know, that um, you might be put on the spot and you might not be able to find the words or find the memory. And I think that this does an amazing job of building that trust. Like I can stop and breathe, observe and use my imagination. It's there for me to be had. So I love that. I just think it's applicable in so many circumstances. It's great. That's great. great. And it's great that they're doing that work. That's so cool. And I, I wonder what sparked that for them. I always have to imagine it was somebody's personal experience with Alzheimer's. It was somebody's, you know, somebody that they loved and mm-hmm. they saw that that person's brain was changing and it inspired them to make a program like that. I think it could be. I mean, I think so many of us who work in the arts, like from the most visible jobs, like performing to the high profile jobs, like producing, but, but also jobs like selling tickets or running a gallery or being an usher, like all of the, all of the people who have a background in the arts, I think can articulate the many ways in which having that background helps them in their daily lives. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've spoken to a million people who, who don't work in the arts, but perhaps they took an improv class in college, um, or they took a public speaking class or, you know, they took an art class and they still recognize how much it benefits them to have had that experience that they can draw from. Yeah. Because I do think it transforms your mind. Yeah. I do. I agree. In I this agree. case for this group, the memory ensemble, so they would they tried to assess and track changes to their mood and behavior, you know, before and after class. Oh and yeah. One of the key learnings, one participant of the group said, I'm not sure that my memory has objectively improved but I am sure that my ability to cope with my memory loss has improved. That is great. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? It is great. And as somebody, as I age, I know that something, and I joke about it, but I, you know, I joke about my early onset Alzheimer's and dementia, Mm -hmm. but I, I feel like I, there are things like this mantras, like the one that you just shared with us and even, Uh, practices that I've tried to implement in order to ease some of that, um, whether it's memory loss or my anxiety around it, Mm -hmm. you know, so things like meditating and um, mantras like the one you just shared. I think that's, uh, I think that's so cool. I mean, are just having ways in which to cope with those, with those um, realities of life. Yeah. Um, I did continue to gather some evidence because I kept feeling like if we're going to go on science, let's go all in on science. Then you know, these are, we have gut feelings and of course we know, right. But let's, so I dug into an article in medical news today. And of course they had me at the beginning because they reminded me like we've been creating, human beings have been creating since prehistoric times, literally more than, you know, almost 40,000 years ago our ancestors left some of their first marks, those, those cave paintings, the, the outlines of their hands and, and drawings of animals, some that, you know, with the use of the, the fire animated on the walls of caves. Um, and God, when you think about that, I'm like, yes, we were meant to be creative beings. We are all capable of, of creativity in this comprehensive article on the connection between art, healing, and public health, Heather L. Stuckey and Jeremy Noble say that art helps people express experiences that are too difficult to put into words. That, and that reminded me of the quote from Nietzsche that says, we have art in order to not die of the truth. Oh, And that, uh, then I was like, oh, I forgot about that. And that is like that, what, that's what hit me in, in terms of the year 2020, um, the truth around us, the very painful things happening around us. We have art in order to not die of the truth. Oh my God. I don't know that I've ever heard that. Wow. 
I Me had too. heard it and I was like, wow, I, I, I put that away somewhere. <laughs> so God. art is how we cope with difficult truths. And if that's so, then we need art now more than ever in a very yeah. real and very vital way. Science has also proved that engaging in the fine arts can lead to the improved mental health we talked about, including maintenance and reconstruction of a positive identity, a boost mm. in our immune system, which frankly, I think we would all welcome right about now. <laughs> yes. I, Increased feelings of happiness and joy from the elevated dopamine levels, improved cognitive function, it it assists in overcoming trauma and negative emotions. And of course, there's physical benefits from dance and movement. Alice Walker said, hard times require furious dancing. And that just gets me like, (sighs) I've been feeling that all year. And that was... Mm. There was a great reminder that we absolutely need to be moving our bodies and, you know, in order to cope with everything we've been asked to cope with this year. Yeah. And lastly, I want to say this. I also read about a therapist named Natalie Rogers, who's the daughter of Carl Rogers. No kidding. That's right. That's right. Who wrote The Theory of Creativity. She wrote this article called Giving Life to Carl Rogers' Theory of Creativity. And in it, she said this, in these times where conformity is being thrust upon us by governments, we urgently need strong individuals who are able to think and act creatively. Creativity threatens those who demand conformity. Dictators squelch self-expression and the creative process. They do not want their citizens to think for themselves or to be spontaneous, imaginative, or self-determined. Thus, Creativity is subversive to those who demand conformity to a political system. I believe that to maintain and foster democracy in our world, we must be creative. That is to be able to play with ideas, see alternative solutions, and be able to listen (gasps) empathetically to all sides. With that, I was reminded of the relevancy, the urgency even, of creativity and the very, very real need for each of us to express acts of creativity every day, every day. So let me just say, when I consider what to make of it, I genuinely think anything, effing anything, everything by engaging in creative acts, large or small, perhaps trying out a new flavor of jam on your muffin in the morning or getting yourself a coloring book or a 10 foot canvas and just going for it, or maybe journaling each day, rearranging the furniture in your bedroom or freestyle dancing in the driveway. It's all creative. And if you're blocked by the big ideas, maybe set those aside for now. Like you don't have to be writing a novel right now. You don't have to paint a masterpiece right now. Maybe bring down your expectations if they're getting in your way. Be kind to yourself. Perhaps just go spark harvesting and put those ideas in your spark file for when you have more energy and more capacity. And how about celebrating every spark of creativity you do find? Every single act of creativity benefits you personally and may also benefit others. It might even serve as a subversive act against conformity and help us rebuild a culture that is inclusive of diverse ideas and perspectives. That's where I'm God. feeling right Damn, now. Camion. I don't know if I told you. That is like you. a mega spark. Well, it was a lot. It was a lot to fit into this, but I it really restored my faith. I I was like, yes, 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 yes. I can put that little little streak of doubt that had crept up. I can set that aside and and not give it any of my attention or time. Yeah. Um, And I was happy. I was happy for that. I mean, of course, like I know these things and you know these things, but I needed a little refresher. I needed a reminder and to be grounded in not just what I suspected to be true, but is in fact provable and true. Just period. True. True. And you got the science to back it up, baby. I got the science to back it up. 
I don't know if I told uh, you this, but Tim, my friend Tim has said that he's been using this time to rethink and reconsider what he wants to do with his remaining yeah. time on earth. Yes. And he's exploring potentially going back to school to study drama therapy. And I have to say, especially after being reminded of the healing power of creativity, I can think of no better way to serve others than to, to spread the word and to use our artistic talents to help others and help ourselves heal. I think it's great. And, you know, it's so funny. It sort of answers a question that I've been sitting with ever since that coaching client was sort of like, uh, is this all, I mean, the world has so many more pressing needs. Creativity Mm -hmm. feels indulgent right now. And uh, what I couldn't fully articulate, which you just did so beautifully with that spark is say, that's how we're going to rise up out of this time through all different acts of creativity and even how we're going to heal. That's so right. what we heal a, ourselves, we heal each other. Yeah. What a great flipping spark. Holy Yay! moly. Way and to, we're back. Way to bring it back, Cammy. Fuck around and find out. Fuck That's around right. and find out. Fuck around and find <laughs> out. You think all I right. can't write a spark? Fuck around and find out. I never, I never said you could write a spark. I know. I was joking. I was just trying to put it in context. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> should we take a little breaky poo and then I'll yes. try to spark you back? Okay, okay great. Let's do awesome. it. Spark! Camion, may I interest you in a second helping of spark? I would like a big old helping of sparks, please. Well, all right. I've got one for you. And I want to okay. say that there's, uh, here are some sources for this spark, a Time Magazine article by Eric Barker, an article on PBS.org, a book by Stephen Southwick and Dennis Charney called Resilience, the Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges. Mm-hmm. Cams, I will tell you, I'm just going to lay it bare right at the top. I wanted to do a spark about resilience. I have been thinking in the same way that you were like, I need to go looking for this spark about yeah. why creativity and why now. I have been thinking a lot, a lot, a lot about resilience during this time mm-hmm. and noticing in myself and in others a sense of resilience or what seemed to be a testing of my resilience yeah. slash other people's hell, resilience. Hell yeah. And I've, I've noticed, and we've t- talked about this, how some people seem to really, really be struggling, just like stuck in struggle. And some folks seem to be really called to action during this time and seem to be like much more in the flow uh, with that call to action. And I have felt both ways. I have felt, t- yeah. there are times when I have felt very like, just sort of like, I am going to, you know, use this, not even in spite of this pandemic, but I was like, if this is where we're at right now, what can we do now that we have never done before? Mm -hmm. Like really, really keyed into that and really uh, like in the flow in a good way. And then there have been times, Cams, and you have, you have witnessed this where I have hit a wall and then climbed onto the struggle bus and just like took a nice long ride on the struggle bus. Yeah. And the driver kept looking back and saying, is this your stop? And I'd say, no, I'm going to ride on this some more. <laughs> so, and Take me go. back around. But Suze, <laughs> I want to add to that. The other day I wrote, I literally jotted this down like, wow, there are moments where I have like shock and awe. I have surprised myself with my own ability to survive, like my own survival skills and resilience, yes. is, which is what I think you're talking about. And then other days slash weeks where I'm like, Ugh, I'm just, I just feel shaken and completely off. And if, if you ask me what I want to do, I want nothing other than to curl up in a yeah. ball yeah. and be like, I don't feel like being resilient right now. I don't I think want to. Pretty- yeah. And for anybody, for you and for anybody listening, I think that's pretty natural and I think it's super natural right now, mm-hmm. but in, in observing myself and you and other loved ones in our lives who have sort of been doing this dance, I was really, this furious dance. I was really curious mm-hmm. if resilience was something that could be actively cultivated 
And so I looked in a lot of places and I don't know if you saw it, but I, I asked on Instagram what resources people could recommend on the topic of resilience. And I got a lot of really, really good responses. And I, I, I dove into them. Like I listened to Brene Brown's podcast yeah. and specifically there was one with a guest named David Kessler, who I think you may have referenced in a past spark, who's like a grief expert. Uh -huh. um, yeah. The book Option B by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant. Uh, Eva Price, who's a Broadway producer who we know and love. Hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. Eva Price gave a TED Talk about having and recovering from brain surgery. Mm. Um, there's a woman named Lizzie Velasquez who has a series of really, really excellent talks and TED Talks. Um, people recommended the book Wave about a woman who lost her husband and two children in the 2004 oh. tsunami. Um, oh. Also the book Once More We Saw Stars by Jason Green, which is a memoir about he, how he and his wife coped when their toddler was killed in a tragic accident. And I took a deep dive into these resources. And, and I have to say they were great, but for the most part, they're also, they're anecdotal and I appreciated them so much, but I was like, okay, okay, how can we be more resilient? I know that you're saying that we should, but how? Mm -hmm. And there, there were little pieces of wisdom not, and big pieces of wisdom in those things about how we could be more resilient. But I still was still left with this question of what factors, specific factors contribute to a person's resilience. Oh my God. I hope you're going to tell us because I, I, I think educators have been grappling with this for a long time. There's that book grit and yeah. this idea yeah. of like, how do you teach children to have it? Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. can define it and then how do you help them have it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. And yes. So in the midst of all of this, the weirdest coincidence occurred. So I'm literally, literally hands on the keyboard in the middle of putting this spark together and struggling with it, honestly, because I was like, okay, I have all of these stories and anecdotes about people who demonstrated resilience, but I don't really know. I don't know what to say about it. And then I get an email from a client asking if I'm available to lead a creativity workshop with their group. So I'm speaking to the client and next to them on the Zoom is one of their closest friends. And I'm asking the close friend about what she does. And I ask her what she's making. And she says one of her projects, which is temporarily on pause because of the pandemic, is on resilience. Oh and my I was like, gosh. I go, did you say Brazilians? And she goes, no, resilience. And I was uh, like, I, I literally paused my work on this spark to take this call. <laughs> and here is this person. So the figure at the center oh of this documentary that uh, she is making is this dude named Dr. Stephen Southwick. He is an MD from Yale. And according to this wonderful woman slash spark bearer that I've just met, Stephen Southwick is an authority on resilience. He has literally written the book on resilience for clinicians, but this documentarian wants to make this film on resilience featuring Dr. Stephen Southwick so that normal everyday people like you and me can mm. understand it and benefit from it. Mm. So I look, I look up Dr. Stephen, I get off the phone and I immediately look up Dr. Stephen Southwick and oh my God, Camion, I hit the spark <laughs> jackpot. The mother load. I've Amazing. never had something exactly like that happen. It was so crazy. So it's incredible. Um, it was amazing. So I just want to shout out Linda, Linda, who was the spark bearer for this. I cannot thank you enough. So with Dr. Dennis Charney, Stephen Southwick wrote a book called Resilience, The Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges. And I was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. This is the research behind resilience. I've been poking around all over the place. I'm, <laughs> I'm not finding exactly what I want. This woman, this beautiful woman out of the blue hands it to me, which is a side spark, which is sparks will come to you if you're present for them. <laughs> so, so back true. to resilience. So true. So um, to your questions, Camion, what is it? How do we define it? And in their book, Dennis Charney and Stephen Southwick write, 
In the physical sciences, materials and objects are termed resilient if they resume their original shape upon being bent (gasps) or stretched. In people, resilience refers to the ability to bounce back after encountering difficulty. And they go on to say, in his book, Aging Well, Harvard University psychologist George Vellant, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, describes resilient individuals as resembling a twig with a fresh green living core. When twisted out of shape, such a twig bends, but it does not break. Instead, it springs back and continues growing. Um, so there's a little bit of a definition of resilience for mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what I were just, you going to say? I just want to explore just for a second because my mind went to like that idea of like something going back to its original shape. But mm-hmm. but in humans, I think of resilience as yes, bending but not breaking, and then yes. returning, but in an altered slash yes. improved state. Do they yeah. talk about that, or is that, yeah. is that just what's going on in my mind? Yeah, they do talk about that. They do talk about that, and it's actually that what we can say that. I don't, I don't know if you want to call it positive change or evolution that mm. occurs or mm-hmm. alchemy or whatever you want to call it, I think is one of the um, hallmarks of resilience that somebody can metabolize like a challenging situation mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, maybe even improve because of it. But mm-hmm. I'll use their words because I feel like I'll just botch it. So, but yes, we're going to get to that. So, okay, great. Um, they say... In this book, they say that traumatic events throw our lives into turmoil in unpredictable ways, and no two people will respond to them in exactly the same manner. For some, the stress of an event will become chronic and last for years, Mm -hmm. and the individual may undergo a dramatic change in outlook. They may become sullen, demoralized, withdrawn, cynical, and angry. And I think we all have observed people like that. Maybe we've observed a taste of that in ourselves as well. Some people will become depressed or develop PTSD. Horrific intrusive memories and nightmares will haunt them for days, months, even years, and they will feel unsafe in the world, hypervigilant, as if another serious danger lurks just around the corner. I, I have experienced that for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Some will take up drinking or drugs to numb their pain and all their memories. Nevertheless, many people will find ways to meet the challenge and continue with purposeful lives. For a period after their ordeal, they may become distressed, but in time, they will bounce back and carry on. For some, it will be almost as if the trauma had never occurred. For others, the distress will persist, but they will find healthy ways to cope. Here you go, Camion. Some survivors Mm. will even grow stronger and wiser because of their trauma. Mm. These survivors may report that their tragedy has helped them to appreciate life more, to become closer to family and friends, to find greater meaning, and sometimes to embark on a new mission in life. In the words of Elizabeth S. Lucas, a protege of um, Viktor Frankl, the forces of fate that bear down on man and threaten to break him also have the capacity to ennoble him. And I think that's what you're talking Mm. about, Camion, which is not only does the twig not break, it is transformed or it evolves or it is ennobled in some way. Mm -hmm. So, So all of that is to say there are lots of different ways that people respond to challenge and traumatic events. And uh, I know that in that description, with the exception of, I never took up like drinking or drugs to numb my pain, but I've taken up other things to numb my pain. <laughs> but I've, I've had, I feel like I've dabbled in all of that, that all of sure. the aforementioned myself. Sure. Um, yeah. So I was like, I read all that and I was like, I want to be in the group that grows as a result of a challenge yeah. and yeah. even as a result of trauma. And I really do, do believe that if you have to live through it, surely there must be a way for it to ultimately have a positive impact. But I've always thought in order to get there, you have to be willing to remain present to the present while at the same time, keep moving, not getting stuck. And eventually like one foot in front of the other, marching through the challenge or the trauma. And in that way, you can eventually draw from the experience and decide what meaning you're going to derive from it, what lessons you're going to take away from it. So that's where my mind has been, but I'm not a I'm not a Yale or a Harvard doctor who studied this. So I was just curious what these fellas had to say about it. So, I mean, 
no doubt 2020 has been fraught with challenge and trauma for many people. And I wanted to know specifically in response to this time, even how to bolster my resilience, because I do want to move through this time with grace while also remaining present to it, because this is going to be our life for you know, the foreseeable future. For the foreseeable future. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I, I've made a habit in my life. I don't want to wish it away. I don't want to say, oh, I can't wait till this is over. Oh, yeah. I can't wait till I've, I've really tried to catch myself with that yeah. because time is precious and fleeting and I don't, I don't want to wish it away. So yep. uh, I dug into this work of Dr. Stephen Southwick and Dennis Charney to see what I could learn about how to bolster my own resilience and hopefully, uh, you cams your resilience and you little sparklers your resiliences um so these fellas interviewed a lot of different kinds of people to learn about resilience and a lot of people that really do work that puts them i would say really in (laughs) toe-to-toe with like trauma and challenge so this these are prisoners of war folks in special forces people who have encountered high levels of stress and then demonstrated resilience. And then they analyzed these interviews and they identified 10 resilience factors that proved to be effective for dealing with stress and trauma. More about that in just a moment. I just want to make an an acknowledgement that we have talked about we, we talk about it sometimes in our workshops. We've talked about it in different contexts, but I just want to say this again. The play, and they, they write about this so beautifully in their book. The playing field is not level when it comes to resilience. Individuals who are, for instance, unable to think clearly, regulate their moods, they would have trouble implementing the advice of this work in their lives. Because for instance, if you're experiencing a major depression or you've suffered a traumatic brain injury, that path, that path to bouncing back may be steeper. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there are folks who have more resources such as financial security, a higher level of education, an interesting and rewarding career, Mm. strong social networks. People that have any of the aforementioned are able to leverage those resources and people who lack those resources may fall into what they call a loss spiral. Um, So they give the example of a family that loses its home to a hurricane. And one family may have no, literally nowhere else to live. Another family may have the option of moving in with relatives. Another family may be fortunate enough to have a second home. So you can see how... If you're the family that literally has nowhere else to go, mm-hmm. like you hope to find space in a shelter, you can see how that is a steeper path back. Oh that resilience is not going to be as easy. Yep. So, and, yeah. And just when yeah. you're just feeling the sense of like dominoes falling and you exactly know, the consequences of spiral. one thing on the next. Yeah. Absolutely. I I want to read what they say in their book because I think it's worth reading. When we advocate for resilience, we believe that most of us can choose to fight back after a trauma and attempt to right ourselves. However, we must emphasize that some people lack access to support and resources that make it easier or even possible to do so. This does not mean that those with scarce resources should give up, but rather recognizes that they will have a more difficult road to travel. Understanding these limitations may allow us to be more patient with ourselves or with others who are striving to recover from trauma. And I want to add to this, it may make us more empathetic and more inclined to be of support to others Mm -hmm. to help them bolster their resilience during a time like the one we're living through now. I feel like that's a spark. Like if you want to like study resilience for your own benefit, rock the fuck on. But also I think it's worthy study, I think it's worthy to study it, to understand that playing field isn't level and you might come up with a really great creative way to be of support to somebody who doesn't have um, the resources that you do so that you can help people bolster their own resilience and get back yeah. up on their feet, especially during a time like this. Yeah. yeah. Suze, I feel the need to like confess a little bit because I recognize in my younger self, I, you know, I've, I've had the ability to be resilient and it could be as small as like, 
you know, working when sick or, you know, just yeah. like, yeah. um, suffering through it, getting through it, um, digging deep and, and making it happen anyway. And yeah. I feel like I, in reflecting back, I feel like I had little patience with other people who couldn't do the same thing, whatever the things yeah. were that happened that I was able to do, like, why yeah. couldn't other people do that too? Yeah. And of course, in my wise old age, I, I definitely along the way learned um, what they're talking about is like, not everyone has the same skills, um, skill set or beginning circumstances to work with. And then, um, and you don't know, you don't know what they're going and you through. You don't know. And you don't yep. know, you'll never be able to know. And and then, frankly, it's only after, you know, I've had periods of time where I struggled with things and I was like, oh, man, I should have been a little bit more patient with, with people when they were struggling with things. Yeah. So much wiser now, but I just want to say, <laughs> I, you know, I, now I have it sorted. Um, but, but no, I just feel like we don't know. I want to yeah. add to that, yeah. which when your um let's say your resilient tank has been drained your what emily fletcher would call your adaptation energy has been drained yes. by challenges challenges that you are facing i think it's even more uh it takes even more effort to have that empathy mm -hmm. and remember the playing field is uneven. You don't know what other people are going through. 100%. Yeah. We yeah. have no idea. And this year has illustrated that to the millionth degree. That yeah. uh, just that idea of like, we're all in the same storm. We are not in the same boat. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm. Cams, I'm so excited to share some of these resilience factors with you and all of you sparklers. And I would actually, as we talk and as you listen, sparklers, I would love to hear how you all may have already implemented some of these mm. in your own lives or how you want to implement them. So make sure you hit us up. How, what did the kids yes. say? Hit us up on social. Tag <laughs> us. Um, so there's an article by Eric Barker in Time Magazine. And I got to say, Eric Barker did me a solid because Eric Barker distilled down some of these findings from the book Resilience into, into his article. So thanks, Eric. You're a peach. Um, the first, and these are not necessarily, uh, I actually, I don't think these are in order of importance, but uh, I've heard Dr. Stephen Southwick talk a little bit and he has underscored what he thinks is the first place to look. So when I run into that one, I'll let you know. So number one, be optimistic. So we're talking about looking on the bright side. Yes. And that's going to keep us going. Yes. But we're not talking about delusional sort of Pollyanna style rose colored glasses here. Truly resilient people who need to survive the harshest situations and still accomplish goals balance a positive outlook with a realistic view of the world. So this is actually from the book Resilience, The Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges uh, by Dennis Charney and Dr. Stephen Southwick. And they say this, like pessimists, realistic optimists pay close attention to negative information that is relevant to the problems they face. However, Unlike pessimists, they do not remain focused on the negative. Mm -hmm. They tend to disengage rapidly from problems that appear to be unsolvable. That is, they know when to cut their losses and turn their attention to problems that they believe they can solve. So in an interview I watched with Dennis Charney, who uh, again, co-authored the book, he talked about something called the Stockdale Paradox. It's named after Jim Stockdale, a heroic prisoner of war. And it defines the optimism that is most important in becoming a resilient person. So you might look at a challenge or trauma and say objectively and realistically, I'm in really big trouble. And on the other hand, you have the attitude and the confidence to say, but I will prevail. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a tough spot, but I will prevail. And uh, that sort of balance and we're going to look at it again uh in the next uh facet of resilience but that sort of balance of this is tough or this hurts 
but I'm going to be okay, or this sucks, but I will prevail is kind of where that seems like the sweet spot in terms of resilience. That it's so important to make that, um, that specification because so many people think optimism is like Pollyanna and falsehood. Like you're just pretending like everything's okay. Everything's okay. When in actuality, you can be a true optimist by looking at something and saying, this is not okay. And I am capable of fixing it and I can overcome this and I can achieve this, you know, yes. um, both yes. things can be true. You can, it, optimism can hold those multitudes. Yeah, they cite a really nice passage from Helen Keller, who um, I trust everybody knows who Helen Keller is. But they were they said in the book how Helen Keller saw adversity as a prerequisite for real optimism, and mm. that's it's that thing where you know this is from her this is from her writing. A man must understand evil and be acquainted with sorrow before he can write himself an optimist and expect others to believe that he has reason for the faith that is in him. Oh. And and I I think that's I do think it makes it credible if you're sort of like I I view myself as this kind of person frankly where it's like I've been through some shit. I have been <laughs> through some shit and I still for the most part remain pretty yes. positive and pretty optimistic. Yes. And yeah. I feel like it lends credibility to that optimism. And it isn't just sort of like Pollyanna pie in the sky because I've been through some shit. So That's I right. actually, I dug that. Okay. So moving on, facing your fears. So mm. neuroscience says there's only one real way to deal with fear. You need to face it head on. And that is what most resilient people do. When we avoid scary things, we become more scared. When you face your fears, they become less frightening. What do special forces soldiers think when facing the most terrifying situations? This actually relates to number one. They think things like this. I'm scared, but I can learn from this. Or Mm. this is a test that's going to make me stronger. So this actually reminded me, Camion, of this. I don't know. Did I ever tell you the story about how, I'm going to say about two and a half years ago, um, I wanted to get some furniture, some big pieces of furniture for our house. And, uh, you know, this is normally something that I would be like, Nathan, help me. But he was unavailable. And so, but I really wanted to do this and it was time sensitive. So I rented a U-Haul truck by myself and I drove some pretty like windy, windy, mountainy, treacherous roads what? to to about an hour there, loaded the truck and drove it an hour home by myself. And I was really viscerally scared. I oh. was really, really scared. And I was I, I wasn't used to driving a truck that big or being up that high or not being able to see out of the sort of rear view mirror that's on the windshield. Mm-hmm. And so it was all like I could feel the wind blowing the truck. And I said to myself, I accidentally stumbled onto this, a mantra like this, where I was, I was like, I'm scared, but I can do this. And I was literally saying out loud to myself in the cab of the truck, you've got this, you've got this, this is scary, but you have got this, this, Susan. You've got this. And I will tell you when I got home and pulled that truck into the fucking driveway and pulled up the thing, we unloaded the furniture. I felt like. I could do anything. Uh, I felt like I had really like, like face to fear and slay to dragon. So I related to that. So incredible. That is so mm. incredible. I, it's reminding me of my brother when he was raising and still is raising, but my niece Bailey, when she was like three years old, she was terrified of Santa Claus. And oh, he talked, you're kidding. Her, no, I've and never he, heard of that. He talked to her about like, and, and, and my, my stepmom like collected Santa Clauses. So there were a lot of <gasps> around the Santa house. Santa phobia. Yes. Oh my God. And oh my God. one day I came upon her. She was like behind a couch where <gasps> like Santa was, was right near it. And I came upon her doing this very self-talk. She was saying, it's okay. I'm okay. 
I'm okay. It's okay. <laughs> and wow. then, she, and I, I watched her as she then like got up and like faced that Santa Claus that was just around the other side of the couch. And I, I talked to my brother about it and I was like, Scotty, that, what I just witnessed was amazing. And he's like, yeah, we've been working on that. Um, amazing. You know, really talking, saying to yourself, it's okay. I'm scared, but I'm, I'm okay. And Sue's look wow. at you just like you employed that as you're driving through these treacherous mountains. I'm really experimenting with this in real time cams where I'm trying to disrupt negative, consciously disrupt negative thoughts yes. and reframe them. And I've been, because I have felt the need to do it lately, I yeah. have been really practicing it. And uh, there are some that are more deeply rooted and it takes it's going to, it's going to be rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Yeah. But, um, but I'm working on it. So I like having things like that in my little toolkit mm -hmm. and like the mantra that you just shared with us is near spark. I like having that in my toolkit. Yeah. Um, great. yeah. So let's jump back in. Number three, this one actually was so surprising to me. Have a moral compass. The emotionally mm. resilient people that Southwick and Charney studied all had a strong sense of right and wrong. Despite being in situations that could threaten their lives, they always thought about others, not just themselves. So mm. it's, a, it's a strong moral compass, strong right and wrong, but also a strong awareness, it sounds like, of other people's well-being. And this is from their book. In our interviews, we found that many resilient individuals possessed a keen sense of right and wrong that strengthened them during periods of extreme stress and afterward as they adjusted to life following trauma. Also, altruism, selflessness, concern for the welfare of others, and giving to others with no expectation of benefit to the self often stood as a pillar of their value system, of their moral compass. And I read that oh. and I was like, check, I've got it. I've got a strong moral compass. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you don't, there's something to work on. Work on that moral compass. Wow. If you're a sociopath, work on it. Yeah. Um, I think you have a strong moral compass too. I'm going to give you a check too on that Thanks. one. Thanks. Thank you. Check. I feel like I check, do. Check, check. Yeah. yeah. And it is one of those though that makes me wonder like that second question of like, if you don't have one, where do you get one? Um, that's a different know. spark for it. That's another okay. spark, another for, another spark for another day. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm setting so, it aside. Um, here we go. This one, this one is actually, um, this is, this is something that, uh, I find very interesting and is actually something you, one could work on. So it is number four, practice spirituality. This mm. was the number one thing that one researcher found when studying people who overcame tragedy. In the book Resilience, the authors cite the work of Dr. Ahmad, who found religious belief among survivors to be the single most powerful force in explaining the tragedy and in explaining survival. But Camion, what if you're not religious? Let us peel back a layer. Oh. Because if I'm not interested in engaging in like organized religion, but they didn't say religion, they said practice spirituality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So much of the strength from religious activity comes from dun, 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 being part of a community. Oh. So you don't have yes. to do anything you don't believe in, but you want to be part of a group that strengthens your resolve. So this is from their book again. The word religion comes from the Latin term religare, I don't know how to pronounce it, meaning to bind. People who regularly attend religious services may have access to a deeper and broader form of social support than is often available in a secular setting. So this is what, this actually goes back to all the, the sparks that, or not all the sparks, but this actually goes back to some of the sparks from um, The Art of Dying Well, oh. which is, and it's something I think about all the time. And it's the one thing that when I just clicked on like a one minute video with Dr. Stephen Southwick, and he was like, when people ask me about resilience, the first thing that I want to ask them is, do you have a community of people that you could rely reliably reach out to and really like that they would be there to support you, that you could share your real feelings with them, that you could really talk with them. And if you don't have that, that I would think is the first thing that you want to develop in order to bolster and strengthen your resilience. So 
Wow. I offer you that. Wow. If it's, if it's something you need to tend to. And I, frankly, I think about that. I'm like, I want to make sure that I, as an introvert, sometimes I can just put my head straight at my mm-hmm. ass, but I mm-hmm. want to make sure that I really make a beautiful investment in those relationships yeah. because not only is it it's good for all of us in so many ways, meaningful engagement. It's so good for us, but it also seems that it really supports resilience. So there wow, you go. Wow. That is so yeah. good. Yet another thing it supports. There yeah. you go. And Great. it actually feeds into number five, which is get social support. So if you're, again, if you're not part of a religion or, or a community, friends and loved ones are key when life gets hard, but we can't always be surrounded by others especially in a pandemic, Camion. Mm -hmm. Um, But how can we love and respect, sorry, how can people we love and respect help us thrive and how can we help those that we love and respect to thrive when we are separated? And so they gave me and I give you a story that I heard about some time ago, but they reminded me of it. Do you know the story about the tap code, Camion? No. Have you ever heard? It's a great spark. It is a standalone spark. It is okay. beautiful, but I'm going to bust it out now. Okay. So in <laughs> June of 1965, four prisoners of war, their names were Captain Carlisle Smitty Harris, Lieutenant Philip Butler, Lieutenant Robert Peel, and Lieutenant Commander Robert Schumacher, who were imprisoned in the same cell in the Hanoi Hilton they devised a simple secretive tap code. These four men, expecting to be split up again, vowed to continue their resistance. And to do so, they knew that communicating closely would be essential. So they developed this tap code by tapping on the walls of their cells so that the the fellow prisoners could hear it and they would be able to respond without the guards knowing. Wow. And it was a code. It's this simple like five across, five down code um, that indicate letters so you can quickly spell out, you can quickly spell out words. And it this tap code let them know that they were not alone in their suffering. Oh my gosh. And it provided this critical lifeline Mm -hmm. that allowed scores of prisoners to connect with one another because slowly over time, they taught this tap code to other imprisoned men in this um, prisoner of war camp. And they said, they, if they hadn't had the tap code, they wouldn't have remained sane. And they developed friendships for life via that tap code. Friendships with people whose faces they didn't even see for years. That's incredible. That's it's, it's amazing. Incredible. And I have to tell you, these were people, uh, trigger warning, these were people that were tortured mercilessly. Like these were people that were isolated and tortured and they demonstrated such resilience. They came out on the other side because they were bonded through this tap code. So prisoner of war, Vice Admiral James Stockdale wrote a book with his wife, Sybil, called In Love and War. And he said, our tapping ceased to be just an exchange of letters and words. It became conversations, elation, sadness, humor, sarcasm, excitement, depression. It all came through. Some of the acronyms entered POW popular usage. One acronym, GBU, was used as a universal sign-off, and it was shorthand for God bless you. Aww. So I say I I want to say this to you, like, and anybody who's listening who is Zoom fatigued, if these men can survive this isolation and this torture with this tap code, we can survive and we can have true connection and really meaningful connection with others via this beautiful technology that we have. That's correct. And Yes. And that connection releases oxytocin, which calms our minds and reduces stress. And so find your tap code, Mm -hmm. find your tap code. (laughs) Yeah. Which takes us to number six, have resilient role models. So when you study kids who grow up in impoverished circumstances, but go on to live productive, healthy lives, what, what did they find? They had great role models who provided positive examples and supported them. So it could be, um, this is actually in the book, 
one of the first psychologists to study resilience was a person named Emmy Werner. And Emmy followed the lives of children who were raised in impoverished homes with alcoholic, abusive, or mentally ill parent or parents. And Werner observed that resilient children who grew up to be productive and emotionally healthy adults had at least one person in their lives who truly supported them and served as an admired role model. And the research of the gentleman who wrote Resilience found similar patterns. All of the resilient individuals they interviewed had role models whose beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors inspired them. But also, it, it also seems to work if you find what they refer to as sort of like negative role models. So you could also identify people who you don't want to emulate, who you don't admire, and you can sort of do the opposite. So it, you know, you could have kind of a tough, like tough parent, but you could be like, I'm actually going to do the opposite of that. I'm going to be, if they're That's violent, right. I'm going to be peaceful. If they're, you know what I mean? It's like so, learning what not to do. I learned a lot from that person, mostly what not to do or what not, exactly. not to be. Yeah. Negative role models, baby. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Camion, you're going to love number seven. Number seven coming at you. Maintain physical fitness. Woo! Camion. Yes. 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 So again and again, the authors of Resilience saw that the most resilient people had good exercise habits and kept their bodies as well as their minds strong. And this is what they say in their book. Many of the resilient individuals we interviewed have a regular habit of exercise and believe that staying fit has helped them both during their traumatic ordeals and during their recovery. In fact, some of them credit physical exercise with saving their lives. Mm. It's and they they say that it seems like the stress of exercise helps us adapt to the stress that we will feel when life challenges us, and that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. And research bears out that like you know when you're at cams, you know when you're exercising, and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this, or this hurts, or this sucks. But then you do it, you do it because you know it's good for you. You do it because you know you can get through it. And I yeah. think it's a good it it tells the brain and tells the body you actually can. Endure, yes, you can like yeah. rigorous, challenging circumstances. Yes, one hundred percent. One hundred. I have to say, I think you and I both, you and I both, implemented an exercise routine during the pandemic. We did. It, we have it not was been a necessity. Yeah, and it's really helped. Yeah, uh, I. It's been like literally life saving for me. Life changing. Yeah. Life saving. Um, and I would say as much on the mental level as on the physical level. Well, Camion, that leads to number eight, which is what? keep your brain strong. What? Keep your brain strong, Camion. So it turns out that resilient people are are often lifelong learners. Mm. They keep growing their mind. They are learning to learn and adapting to new information about the world. And I have to say, this rocks my world because. I love that we do the Sparkfall podcast because I yep. feel like we continually learn. And yep. I think listeners, we count you in that as well. I hope mm -hmm. that um, one of the benefits of listening to this podcast is that you are like growing your brain and, you know, keeping yep. your, keeping it spongy, keep it spongy. Um, <laughs> that's a phrase that's going to take off. I think keep I, it spongy. I, keep it spongy. But <laughs> I also think like it, it makes, I don't know, it, it makes me happy that we have things that are built into our lives, like yes. this podcast. It's baked that in. Yeah. Can, yeah. I love that. And also during this pandemic, I have learned so much new technology during this pandemic. Yeah. Shit that I'm just like, I cannot believe I know how to do that now. Yep. And I think that's part of it too. So I know sometimes people are resistant to it because they're like, I never wanted to become an expert at Zoom. And I'm like, how about you put a, an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence? <laughs> it, because it's just like, it's, it's, so, it's so good for us. It's so good for our brains and it's so good for our resilience. It is. And it, it leads is. to number nine, Woo. which is be cognitively flexible. Ooh. People who are resilient tend to be flexible, flexible in the way we think about challenges, flexible in the way we react emotionally to stress, 
They say they are people, these types of people are not wedded to a specific style of coping. Instead, they shift from one coping strategy to another, depending on the circumstances. Mm. So in his Time Magazine article, Eric Barker says, what's a good coping style that definitely works? I've spoken to a number of elite military operators, and I've learned the same thing over and over. Be tough? Nope. Ignore it? Nope. They all mentioned, can you guess, Camion? Flexibility. Yeah? Humor. No. Humor. Oh, I thought we were on Humor. Being, wow. It's part of being cognitively fe- yeah, flexible. Yeah, you got to laugh about You got to laugh and keep going. Yeah. You have got to yes. laugh. Oh. Fuck with me and find out, Camion. You have got to <laughs> laugh. You've got to laugh. Um, I love that. Okay. So here is the last oh, one. That's so good. The last one, not that these aren't necessarily in order, but the last one on this list that the beautiful Eric Barker pulled together for me. Thanks, Eric, is find meaning in what you do. Mm. Resilient people don't have jobs. They have callings. They have a mission and purpose in life that gives meaning to the things that they do. So when times are hard, these folks feel a greater purpose is behind them pushing them forward. So this is from their book, Resilience. In keeping with Viktor Frankl's conception of service as a pillar of meaning, the ability to see one's work as a calling may enhance resilience. This holds true even for people performing dirty work jobs. For example, hospital cleaners, which I'm sure this was written before the pandemic, wow. but yes. Yeah. And for people who have been prevented from pursuing their chosen career. I'm going to say that again. This holds true even for people performing dirty jobs and for people who have been prevented from pursuing their chosen career. So I I think that if if you're sort of like, wait a second, I'm not doing work that I find meaning. Does that mean I can't be a resilient person? I would say do some research, do some digging about finding your Mm -hmm. purpose. And if you don't know what it is, I really recommend looking at Simon Sinek's TED Talk, Start With Why, because I watched that thing, I'm going to say seven to 10 times, and my purpose really did like rise to the surface for me. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be doing your dream job in order to, to say with certainty that you're doing purposeful work. You can, you can do some, you can do some research to find that. That's right. And you can also be purposeful and meaningful in how you show up at that job. You know, even if you're not finding meaning in the work, that's right. It's in the relationships and how you do the work. Um, that I think can be really purposeful and meaningful. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Whether your job is like cleaning floors or making fudge, whatever it is, like you really can set intentions around that work that make it meaningful and infuse it with purpose. Yeah. So Camion, that was a well, really, well. I, I encourage if you have any interest in bolstering and strengthening your own resilience, I cannot recommend this book highly enough, Resilience by Dennis Charney and Stephen Southwick. Uh, um, but what do we make of it? What what can we take away from this to increase our resilience during this batshit crazy time that we're living in and beyond? Um, I'm just a little a little recap. See the world clearly, but believe in your abilities. Develop and implement mantras like, this is scary, but I got this. Mm -hmm. Know that hiding from fear makes it worse. Pick something that scares you. Face it. Maybe even overcome it. Mm. Develop a a strong moral compass, a strong sense of right and wrong. Extend that altruism to others. Practice spirituality. Be a part of a group that has strong beliefs. Develop a network of friends that you can really communicate with. Develop your own tap code with a group mm-hmm. of people that you can rely on so that you can give and receive social support. And I'm telling you, this could be over Marco Polo. This could be over Voxer. This could be over Zoom. Tap on the wall of your cell. Send messages mm. that can keep you going and keep your friends going. Identify and imitate resilient role models. These could be people in your life or read about people like Helen Keller and Viktor Frankl or identify people that you know you do not want to be like and (laughs) do opposite day. Exercise, exercise your body, exercise your brain by being a lifelong learner. Keep your brain sharp 
and it will give you solutions when you need them most. Be like Navy SEALs and Special Forces operators and laugh and laugh and laugh and be sure to have meaning in your life and don't just do a job, have a calling, have a purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, why don't you do a little research and start seeking that purpose? Mm. Any of these speaking to you, Cam? Are there any of these that you're like, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take this and I'm going to either try it out freshly or I'm going to double down on it when I don't want to go for that walk and I don't want to exercise. I'm definitely going to double down on so, so much of it. I, yes, the physical and the mental. I like that. I really like the tapping on the wall of your own cell Um, because, you know, I also can really get the blinders on in terms of like, I have work to do. I have to, I'm in a like productivity haze and I have to stop and respond to people who've reached out to me and, and I have to do my own reaching out. And I feel like I'm not, I'm not great at that. And it's, it's inexcusable. It's not good. I, I, I really think it would be um, so beneficial and meaningful to um, be better at that. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. And improve my Me resiliency. Too. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. about that all the time. Yeah. And I struggle with it because I am, I am such a, I, you know, we're busy. We got a lot going on and I'm an introvert and it's so easy to, um, just not tap, not to send the tap out, but I'm, I'm just going to keep on, I'm going to keep pushing myself to do yeah. that. Tap, yeah. Tap, tap. Yeah. It does. It does make me think all the time about that spark that you did, the art of dying well. And, um, the idea of having that community, maybe someday, l- literally a physical community wherein, uh, you know, yes. loved ones and friends live in a commune. Amen. <laughs> live Amen. in community with each other. I just yeah. was yeah. exchanging Marco Polo's with Stephen Pasquale and Pippa Sue. Aww. And we were like, where's it going to be? Where's it going to be? Cam's, yeah. where's it going to be? Yeah. Um, I am actively thinking about where it's going to be so yeah. that when I ta- literally tap on the wall, you're going to be like, Cut it out. Keep it down over there. <laughs> Quiet down, Susan. <laughs> Quiet. When There's I yell, curfew. I've fallen and I can't get up. I don't need life alert. I've got you, Cammy. You're going to come lift me I'll up. I'll be there and I will be able to lift you because I'm super <laughs> Because you are going strong. to be fucking yoked. <laughs> yes. <gasps> oh, friends. <laughs> we hope this put another bunch of sparks in your file. Listen to us when we say, if there is a spark that you would like us to explore, or if you've taken a spark and you fanned it into a flame and you'd like to share that, I hope that you will email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com, or you can submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We will even happily take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you have to share a creative risk that you've taken recently. And we hope you'll follow us on social media at The Spark File and be sure to subscribe, rate, and five-star review this podcast. It really, really, really does help other listeners find us. Mm -hmm. Also, if you like this podcast, we hope you'll share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, come on. What's not to like? Come Come on. on. Fuck around and find out. (laughs) If if something tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, we are writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that's been knocking at your door it's your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame you know you gotta take it and and make make it it. we're so happy to be back we miss you yes thank you so much for tuning in thanks for listening and much more to come Bye. bye when I bump into something that inspires me I dump it in my spark files Could be something that I want to make Or how I want to be I pump it in my spark files I jump into my spark files Let's open up the spark files 
Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. Illum.